Welcome to the Elite Level Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Elaine, and this is the podcast where we explore how elite level performers think, act, and operate. As always, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'd really appreciate if you could take a moment, hit that like button, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, just take a couple of moments and leave us a five-star review. Just lastly, we recently released the Elite Level newsletter. So please visit EliteLevel.co, that's EliteLevel.co, to get wisdom and insights from the best thought leaders in software sales every single week. Now, we'll all, with all of that said, we've got an absolutely incredible guest here today. Parker, it's wonderful to see you. Alex, great to be here, man. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. So, Parker, this is a very, very special uh, episode indeed with you being our, our US debut here. So it'd be wonderful if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, some of your career highlights and your background. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, happy to do so. Um, so my name is Parker Ashley. Uh, I currently serve as the VP in the Americas for strategic accounts for Dark Trace, cybersecurity company actually based out of the UK. Um, sure, a few of your listeners might be aware. Um, I've been in the SaaS space for a little under a decade now. Um, I started at a, a, a startup in the mobile app space as an SDR, spent a little under a year um, on the grind of that SDR life uh, before wanting to take my uh, journey into the SaaS sales space a little bit more seriously. Um, I then actually spent the rest of my career so far at Darktrace, um, starting as an account executive, uh, one of the early hires for the business back when we were Series B uh, out of San Francisco. I was one of the first few sales hires there and um, since then have had the tremendous opportunity to uh, climb through and, and manage teams, manage teams of teams, manage and build regions, uh, take over operations uh, commercially for different parts of the U.S. And now I'm uh, fortunate to work on some of our more interesting strategic projects uh, as a public company, which is which is really fun. So it's been quite a journey, uh, still early on, excited to see what comes next. What an incredible ride and so much to unpack in that, Parker, so I'm really excited to do so. I want to start at the beginning, though, uh, back to your, your college days, uh, biomed and, and more, and certainly something very, very different uh, to thinking about you setting the stage for a career in software sales. So just help us understand a little bit more about those times where you, you went from studying and then easing your way into the the potential of a sales career. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I So... The sales career wasn't always the, the path I was going to go on. I'm sure there are many who who found a passion for it uh, without expecting to, my, myself included. I started out in university wanting to be, since I was probably actually 16, now to think about it, wanting to be a surgeon. Uh, I I'd met with some surgeons. I had fallen into a few medical courses and sports medicine and things like that. And my career, so I thought, was set. And spent all of university dead focused on that goal uh, took the mcat which is the admissions test for for medical school here in the us um, scored within the 98th percentile of that spent months if not a year studying uh, you spent my entire college life in the library uh, studying biomed and, uh, and and organic chemistry and all the stuff that now is completely irrelevant but uh, was really interesting at the time and put all this effort into that goal and uh, about the time I had graduated college, I was taking that test. Uh, I was starting to interview for med schools and things like that. But I was living at home. My parents were like, you got to get a job while you're doing this. Uh, it's also not cheap to go through that process. So I wanted to help fund it. And uh, that's when I started working at my friend's startup. And in that time, I had admittedly fallen out of love with, with medicine and with the healthcare industry as a whole. I just, in the US, I saw a few challenges with it. A lot of my mentors who were doctors and physicians didn't seem to be enjoying their careers, to be to be quite candid. And I wasn't ready to commit 12 plus years of my life to something that at the end of it was unclear, very blurry, and, and I might not enjoy. So interestingly enough, I was uh, taking interviews at med school while I was an SDR. And at some point in that process, I'd, I'd actually gotten waitlisted to a few schools and got accepted into one. And I had to make the decision, do I take out a huge loan and commit the next 12 years of my life or have I fallen out of love with it? And I 
uh, admittedly had, had made the choice, you know, I, I don't think this is the path for me. Maybe I could revisit. Maybe I take a small break and, and really reassess. And that decision was an interesting one because I had, you know, kind of told everybody I was going to be a doctor at this point, my parents included. And um, so my thought process was, well, I kind of like this software thing. The only other thing I've been good at outside of uh, like medicine or, or whatever is, is sales. And the only other thing I've been interested in is technology. And I just didn't think to put the two together uh, in high school. I sold uh, Cutco knives, which is, uh, you'll see a lot of sales leaders in the US had that same background, door-to-door -door sales, which was brutal. Um, and I, that used to be something I was really good at and enjoyed. And I started to find this rift within this SDR role that, oh, I can enjoy this. But if I'm not going to go to medical school, if I'm going to take this leap, I can't do it in a half-assed way. I have to go all in. I have to take this seriously. And I have to level up my career to, to give myself the opportunity to have the earnings and the life that I would have expected as a physician. And uh, so at that moment, I decided I'm going to go all in. Uh, I started looking to go bigger into the, the SaaS world. And that's when Dark Trace found me. I'd been interviewing around. Uh, they had this cool name. They're this British ex-intelligence company in cybersecurity. And most importantly, uh, it would be a complex sale with complex product to big companies. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to dive in head first and I might fail fantastically or I might succeed and it will be fantastic and have it look back since. It's, it's a really incredible story, Parker. One of the things that really stood out for me in all of this is that you, you had this real focus on doing what you enjoy, uh, something that you're passionate about, something that feels purposeful to you in some capacity. What I really want to understand is how for you, you were able to, to really block out the noise, so to speak, of people that were potentially looking at you saying, hey, med school's the way to go, right? This is what a, a real profession is. This is the real thing that you should focus on. But you were able to say, no, like th this is what I want to go for. I know what I want to go and enjoy in life. I know what I feel purposeful and passionate about. So how did you really get there and have that level of depth and conviction to make that type of decision against all odds? It's a really good question. I think there's this... I, I'm not ever sure about the whole follow your passion mentality. I think, you know, that could be really risky depending on what, if your passion is basket weaving, you know, you might not have a longstanding career in basket weaving, but I think if, if you can see a viable path toward uh, a, a good career and it's something that you enjoy, then why not go for it? Um, also, I think for me, I've always, I, my, my father used to tell me this advice uh, if you could be the top 10% of whatever it is you're doing, you're going to, you're going to make money and you're going to be successful no matter what, probably even in basket weaving. I'm sure there's some competition somewhere where people are earning prize money, who knows, but if you could be in the top 10% of whatever you're doing, then you're going to be successful. And, you know, you can't ever, nobody else is going to know what's going to drive you or what's going to, you know, fill your soul or what's going to, you're going to be the most passionate about. Only, you know, that. So it's really hard when you have the societal pressures of, uh, you know, parents are like, my son's going to be a doctor and that's, that's what he's going to do now and whatever. But I also, you know, I was fortunate to have very supportive parents that they, they were not worried about me. They're like, you know what, we, we're sure you're going to be in that top 10%. We're, you're, we're sure you're going to figure it out, but don't half-ass it. You know, you have to go in. If you're going to do it, do it. Um, and so I think that was really helpful for me in knowing that, listen, if I'm going to do it, I'm, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to commit to this. And in terms of, you know, following what, where your interests are and, and, and looking for that bigger picture, I have like horrible ADD. I tend to really lack focus, but where I succeed is things that I find really interesting. Uh, that same ADD has led me to become naturally a very curious person. And if I'm interested in something enough, I will obsess over it and I will want to learn everything about it and study it and be well. And and that's kind of what sales became for me. At first, it was medicine. It's like, wow, this is fascinating. I, I can understand how the human body works and, and how it heals and how it be. And then when it was getting to the art of sales, 
um, it really was that it was it was an art. It wasn't just, oh, I go pitch to people and then I close them for money. It's like, no, I'm solving problems. And there is this nuance to everything you do and how businesses buy is a whole different process to understand than how individuals buy. And, and there's a, such a deep world of, of knowledge in that sales space, which is evidenced by the plethora of sales books and resources and companies to support it. And so it can be very intellectually stimulating if you're looking at it from that perspective. And I think that's how I saw it. I saw it as this arena and a skill for me to learn and master and understand. And that made it very interesting to me. And then, you know, on top of that, you could, you could earn a very good living doing it. So it's kind of a win-win across the board. And I think those were the justifications in my head of like, if I'm going to do it, I'm, I'm going to be the best. I know I could make money doing this. I know I could probably out earn what I would earn as a physician in shorter time if I'm one of the best. And it's kind of interesting. I'm solving problems. I'm helping people. I'm doing cool work with interesting technology and getting to work with some of the world's biggest companies. Like how can you not be somewhat excited about that? Yeah, I, I, I love all of that. I, I'm coming away from this wanting to run a Google search on basket weaving, though, and trying to figure out how much money is being made at the top there. Because I, I would say, Parker, I, I often do talk a lot about uh, the three P's, as I call it, uh, which is really passion, purpose and performance. And I say that the money really follows those things. So um Life is short, right? And so I think it is really important that people look for uh, something they enjoy, but something that gives them that sense of feeling purposeful about what they're doing, right? Because y you blink and, and the years just fly. And if someone's able to find work that, that gives them life, it gives them energy, it, it makes them feel invigorated every day, the, the money always does follow. And exactly like you said, the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.1% of any field out there that there's a lot of money to be made if that's a driver for someone. So I, I love the message in all of that. The, the point of transition I want to lean in on with you here, Parker, is that, that those early years or those early few months when you, you first actually became a sales rep, um, maybe at Dark Traces is a good place to start, just to learn and understand more about what was going through your mind, because it was quite a big shift from what you were doing historically. You, you as you said, went all in and it was a big transition. So what was those first early few months like when you're like, I'm a rep now? I thought I was going to get fired. Uh, I was, I mean, I was, I sucked. I was so bad at it at first. And, you know, I, I went in with an open mind thinking like, you know, I am probably jumping into deeper waters than I'm capable of swimming, but that's going to force me to, to, to sink or swim. That's going to force me to learn or get out. And it's going to be very telling of whether or not this makes sense for me. Um, so those first few months, it was exciting, but also terrifying. And it was earlier on in the business. So, you know, when you're a startup, there's not as much room for failure. You don't have as much wiggle room as if you're, you know, a Google or, or whatever the case is where, you know, if you don't hit your quota, the, the company's going to get on fine. Uh, in, a, in a small org, you know, that's everything. They've got to stay alive. And so the pressure of coming in extremely inexperienced compared to everybody else around me was was pretty high um and it you know i wasn't a rep from day one which is also interesting i came in as an sdr and this did not help the pressure but uh i was showed up about a half hour early for my first um day of training and our ceo uh, at the time had come in and and she sat down and we had a nice little chat it was it was it was awesome it's where we kind of became close and uh, i got to know her a bit and uh, my CMO walks in to start the training. And one of the first thing he says is like, Parker, you're an account executive now. Um, we're just going to give you a shot, which was so awesome. Uh, felt entirely undeserved. But also that is what started that like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So fortunately, the transition for me was very much one of knowledge and education. And how do I learn and study uh, this new skill and then go apply it, which for the past six years is all I've been doing, right? Um, I've been studying like crazy. I've been taking exams. I've been trying to learn knowledge, not just 
like that I could replicate from a science perspective, but also when studying for the MCAT, you study the test conditions, you study the game theory of the test, you take it under conditions of the test, you know, you're, you're really thinking, how am I going to apply this on the day of, and that kind of regimen was part of my day to day for for probably a year. So for me, the transition was, okay, this is another skill I need to learn. This is another vast uh, group of information I need to understand. And so let's just get to it. Let's just pick up every resource. Let's not wait for anybody to tell me how to do it. Let's learn. Um, there's infinite resources out there. Grab them, learn them, understand them, start applying them. Um, talk to every rep we had in the business, which was probably five at the time, uh, and, and go shadow them, see what they're doing, learn, understand. So those first few months, I was not very good, but I spent it absorbing and learning and failing as much as I possibly could. And eventually it started to click and uh, it was a forceful amount of momentum in the other direction, uh, which you know I've been, I've been very grateful for. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the biggest things I think a lot of people would have struggled with over that uh, journey, Parker, is the setbacks, the, the challenges. You said you made a ton of mistakes. You had a lot of failures. And I love the fact that you can open up to us in that way. But what really got you through those moments, right? Because I'm sure there's someone out there listening and they might be in the middle of that war zone right now, right, where they're saying, I, I don't know if I can sustain this. But in your story, you were able to do that and then find your way to a, a pretty incredible run afterwards. So what would your advice be to that person out there right now who's listening and they feel like they're in that moment of failures, setbacks and rejections? You know, I think most of us in, in a sales career, there, there's two, two things I would say to that. I think most of us in a sales career are or should be naturally competitive people. So I was very competitive and I, I didn't let the failure discourage me more. And I tried to keep it on more of the encouragement side from the perspective of, okay, I suck now, but I'm not going to suck forever. As, I, as long as I keep working on it, I'm not going to keep failing. Uh, I want to win. I want to figure this out. I want to improve. I want to grow as a professional and I, I want to be a, a good sales rep. And I think that internal competitiveness and, and it just brings with it a certain amount of grit that you you need to succeed in almost anything because you're going to be bad at any new thing you do any new thing you try anytime you're you're stretching uh, out of your comfort zone you're going to be bad at it and that's okay everybody who's good at something was once bad and i know that's a cliche but it's very true so i think that inner competitiveness and inner grit um, is something that helped me and that's always something i look for when hiring uh, now is is are they competitive, not with other people, but with themselves? Do they want to improve themselves every day, 1% every day or whatever that, that maxim is? Do they want to try to, to accomplish that for themselves? And I think that's huge for any, any aspiring sales rep and, and a big differentiator you see in the top reps versus those that just kind of waddle by. Um, so that was one. I, I would be lying if I said, there also wasn't an intrinsic motivator of fear of failure. Uh, absolute, te absolutely terrified of failure. Now, of course, that comes from, from two places. One, that inner competitiveness and wanting to be the best. But two, I just, I just gave up this path of being a doctor that I've told everybody about for years. And now suddenly I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to, you know, to, to my parents and, and whatever, who don't come from the software sales world or sales in general, like crazy, giving up being a surgeon to be a sales guy. Fantastic. You know, so it was this need to, to not fail so I could prove people wrong and prove myself right. Um, that drove it. And I think one of the, the best things that ever helped me from a mentor early on in my career, you know, he could see my, stress from that constant failure. He could see me on that brink of, of just, I don't think I'm going to figure it out, you know, like right on that cusp of like, do I just give up? Is this not for me? Um, and he was the one who sat me down and said, like, dude, if you take that, the stress is good. If you can recognize um, kind of you stress versus normal stress, and you can use that stress as a motivator, stress historically was used to keep us alive. Uh, as humans, right? Stress was the the uh, evolutionary trait to to keep us sharp, to keep us focused, to help us hunt, etc. 
And unfortunately, our reptilian brain hasn't adapted to modern stresses. You know, we stress over emails or things where we used to have to stress over saber tooth tiger. So our, our mo modern uh, society versus our reptilian brain doesn't really align sometimes. But if you can get into tune with that, and you could say, this stress is good. If I could use this stress not to let me break down, but use it to focus and use it in a, as a positive uh, motivator or positive momentum, that is such a better world to, to live in. And, and I had a mentor that sat me down and, and tried to help me unlock that. And I think he turned that fear of failure into immense focus that allowed me to apply that stress in a more constructive way. Um, so, okay, great. That's fine. I'm going to focus really hard on this call block. I'm going to focus really hard on, uh, you know, mastering this pitch or this demo or this discovery questions. And I'm going to be stressed about just being focused on, on the task at hand and not worrying about what happens if I, if I fail, just doing it to the best of my ability. Um, that really changed the dynamic for me because then I was less worried. I was not thinking about failing. I was thinking about just getting to that next step and really focused on it. I love the passion, Parker, and th this is gold. I I'd love to add to this with something a mentor also said to me at a particular point, which is they, they said to me, Alex, stress is a, is a choice. And what he was trying to drive home in that is that stress ultimately is down to perception, how you perceive a situation, right? Uh, if you get a rejected call, it's not inherently a negative situation. It's the, the, the lens that we put on it that makes it feel like a negative situation. And I think when people get that understanding for themselves, you realize you actually have control, right? You can decide to say, this rejection is inherently negative and I'm gonna allow it to be a setback and make me upset. Or you can say, this is simply just another step and a part of my job and I'm gonna move on to the next call and I'm gonna make it 10 times better by changing these few things. All choices, right? Decisions. Were you going to add something? I was just going to say, this is all very rooted in um, Stoic philosophy. So I'm a big fan of Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and all these Stoic philosophers. And, um, you know, if, if those of you are, are, are struggling to control these thoughts, I highly recommend doing some reading into them. But it's very much the idea that you just mentioned of, you know, you can't harm me. Alex cannot harm me. My boss cannot harm me. A customer or prospect cannot harm me. What they do or they say cannot harm me, physically, verbally, otherwise. Really, the only thing that can harm me is my perception of that incident, right? So if I perceive something as harmful and negative, then it's going to be harmful and negative. So it, it, it's really your, your perception of an event that, to your point, that is what most people feel is harmful versus the event itself. Um, and, and I totally agree with that hundred percent. If you view uh, somebody hanging up on you as a, a failure versus an opportunity to, to, to move some, a non-qualified prospect off your list. Yeah. It's going to be a lot harder. Um, but I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And um, it, it reminds me of a lot of the stoic philosophy that I, I know and love. Parker, I, I've got over 20 books by my bedside on stoicism. And uh, so we've just bonded over that and we didn't even realize. So you, uh, I'm glad you were able to call out what I was, uh, was I was talking to there. But it's, it's incredibly powerful for the space that we're in. And it really ultimately allows people to take control and find a way forward in any given scenario. Parker, I, I want to spend some time on just really your, your journey into leadership and beyond. You, uh, one thing that really fascinated me about about your story on paper is you, you've had a very long run within one company, which is is rare in this uh, rare in this space, right? Uh, we're known for much shorter tenures, uh, but you've continued to grow and climb and take on significant amount of responsibility. So, just tell us about the highlights at each step uh, up until the role that you're in now. Oh, 100 percent. I think the key is for any career or however you want to think about it is you want to have some constant opportunity to both learn and earn, right? If you're, if you're learning, if you're earning, you're doing well, if you're doing one or the other, you're doing okay. If you're doing neither, then maybe you need to reevaluate your situation. And uh, I think we have this obsession now for, for many good reasons and some bad. Um, the, the norm has been two years, make a move. 
two or three years, make a move, make these changes. And really in a sales career, I mean, you don't really get good until maybe after 18 months, two years. Uh, you don't get, you don't really start to figure out the organization you're in until at least a year, maybe, maybe 18 months, maybe more. Some people figure it out sooner than others. But what I found is, you know, you really start to pick up some momentum at that point. And I think a lot of people make lateral moves because they see a short win. They see a, an acute near-term win. Uh, I could get a higher base salary. I could get whatever. Um, but I think developing a lot of, uh, moving up in your career, it, it involves a lot of trust. It involves building the right relationships. It involves uh, gaining a very specific set of knowledge that can be applied in different ways. And for what, what's been really nice for me is in my career at, at Dark Trace, I have been here quite some time, I think seven years. Um, and the reason I always tell people I've stayed is because a couple things. One, I've always been presented with, with new challenges. As soon as I start getting kind of complacent with the environment I'm in, a new challenge is presented and it's a new area to learn and grow and so on and so forth. And over time, as I continue to prove myself, uh, folks on the management team and otherwise will, will recognize that skill and they'll put more trust into me and give me more opportunities to learn and grow uh, vertically versus laterally. And as you make constant leaps, you can, you can eventually make some of those jumps. And some people are successful at that, right? They negotiate their way up or they go down in company size and they get a bigger title or whatever the case is. Um, but what, what's I think people overlook often is the fact that sometimes it, it takes a long time to build that trust. And it's a much easier sometimes to establish that trust, establish that track record in a known group. And then as long as you're being presented the opportunity to continue to cha be challenged and grow and expand your career, there's no shame in leaving as long as you're moving in the right direction. If you're at an organization for four years and you're still a, an SDR, uh, well, then maybe you need to do some reflection on, on where you stand. And if you stand at the top and you're still in that position, 100%, it makes sense to, to look for opportunity elsewhere. Um, but I think as long as you could have that combination of an environment where you're learning, you're being presented with new challenges, and you're also earning, um, it's a much more long-term mentality. So for me, uh, that was really helpful. And, and being able to, okay, great. I, I feel like I've, I've, I've not mastered selling by any means, right? I could still do a lot of work as a rep, but I've gotten really good at it to the point where I'm starting to coach other people. And that's recognized. And then now it's like, well, why don't you just lead a team? Great. That's awesome. Let's do this on a bigger scale. And then the same with team of teams. And then you start learning more about the operational size of the business and how to drive revenue uh, versus just driving, uh, you know, hitting quotas and whatever else and how to adjust territories and how to so on and so forth. And then, okay, great. Maybe you do that full time now. Now you're learning that skill. And so I just found that as a unexplored path, something that I think we've forgotten about where you see a lot of folks who make tremendous strides in their career staying in one place versus making jumps. Um, the only other caveat I'd say is that obviously where you are and who you're with makes a huge difference in, in that journey. If you're not on the right ship, uh, you're not going to end up at the right destination no matter what. If you're not with the right leader, you're never going to learn the right skills to make it to that, that next level. So when you're looking for opportunities and you're, and you're evaluating, it's really important to to, to constantly check where you are, do it that health check of, you know, is, is this business gonna go the distance? Is this leader gonna give me what I need to, to get to that next level, all right? And those are things that you also wanna constantly evaluate because you're putting a lot of your time and energy into this business. And if they're not gonna help you get to that next stage as you're, as you're trying your best to help them, it's not a good enough relationship and you need to look elsewhere. So I think, that's probably how I think about it. Um, and I think it's done me really well to work really well for me. Uh, I'm sure there's some pros and cons in there, but uh, those are at least my pros. Yeah, I, I think the framing is great. I often talk about it through the lens of 
you know, if someone's looking at their career, just write a great story, right? If you look at your career as a as a book, you, you want diversity of experiences, you want a, a, a rich, different array of challenges that you've taken on, just write great chapters in that book. And that can ultimately be achieved in one company, it can be achieved across multiple different companies. But what I love about your story is you've just got really fun chapters, right? New responsibilities, uh, different teams, you know, different challenges to walk into. And it's now put you in a position where you've got a, a great remit of responsibility and a, a, a scalable team, So, which is, which is awesome. I've got a couple of final questions for you, uh, Parker. One quick fire and, and one rounding question. The quick fire is really what drives you at this point in your career? That's a great question. It, it feels like it changes all the time. And I think for a lot of people, the pandemic forced folks to reevaluate what drove them. I think prior to the pandemic, I was driven by my competitive nature. I want to make a bunch of money. I want to climb in my career. I want to be successful. I want to lead other people to success and other people's success will be a mark of mine and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that was, you know, probably a somewhat immature driver, but a very big driver of my career. And now um, it, it's more so uh, a couple things. I think I'm driven very much by freedom of choice. So how can I optimize my career, my life, my finances, uh, et cetera, so that I never feel like I have, I'm stuck in any one position, that I'm opening doors without closing any of them so I could choose which one's the best to walk through at any one point. And so that drives my motivation now. I am I going to you know, choose to take this role that I know will increase my workload by 3x without much of an increase in in financial gain no probably not that might not be worth it for me anymore um am i going to uh choose to spend money on this thing versus going and investing it somewhere probably not anymore um because ultimately i think the 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 however i could optimize my choices for the greatest amount of freedom across uh time and finances is probably going to be how I'm driven. And so from a motivation perspective, um, that helps me be really clear on my decisions. It also gives me a goal of, uh, okay, what do I want 10 years from now? I want to be able to travel freely with my family. I want to be able to work on projects that I only care to work about. Um, and so if it takes money to get there, great, then I need to optimize for that. If it takes flexibility to get there, great, then I need to optimize for that. So I think that is kind of where I'm, I'm leading now. And it's a, it's a very comforting feeling. Um, so I, I'd, I'd say that's big. Another driver I've actually recently rediscovered um, is I have found a new passion for wanting to kind of help others uh, succeed and achieve, um, especially sales reps or, or just young professionals who want to figure out that next step. And, you know, I, I love helping reps get their first big commission check and things like that. Like I love the coaching aspect of that. Um, whereas before I, I think I was managing when I was leading teams. Now I've very much found the joy in, in the coaching element and trying to help work with people versus on top of them or whatever the case is. So I think that's been an interesting motivator that um, I've recently reflected on that I think comes with maturity and some other things most likely. But I think between those two things, if I could help people achieve and make sure that I'm optimizing for freedom and helping people do the same, that's awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. And you're certainly giving some elite level coaching at scale here, Parker. So we appreciate that. My, my final question for you is if you were talking to anyone out there that wants to go from good to elite level in their career, what would the best piece of advice be that you'd have for them? Man, stay curious. Just never lose that sense of curiosity. No matter how good you are at something, there's always somebody else who knows how to do a piece of it better than you. And you, you can't ever stop that learning curve and that excitement because then life, life not only becomes a lot duller, um, but also you, you plateau very quickly. And I think one of the biggest things that as we mature in our careers and as we gain experience, we tend to have a, a natural reaction to, to not look down upon, but maybe dismiss 
uh, folks who are earlier in their career and haven't had as much experience, but they may have done something really different that we've never thought about in a unique way because they lack that experience. And I think there's opportunity to learn from those people just as much as there is for somebody who's been doing it for 50 years. So I think having that open mind and, and that curiosity from the jump and never losing that is going to help you take leaps in your career, in your earnings uh, and, and into your future. Wonderful. Parker, thank you so much for being our US debut. I have personally felt it's an incredible episode. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I hope you've enjoyed the experience as well. I've loved it, man. Thanks for having me. I'd love to be back anytime you need. Fantastic. To anyone out there listening, we appreciate you tuning in. Again, if you're watching this on YouTube, please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. If you're listening on any of the podcasting platforms, please take a couple of minutes to leave us a five-star review. Hope that you've enjoyed and we'll see you on the next one.